We hear a lot about testosterone cypionate being used for microdosing and being used as the number one testosterone ester. But did you ever wonder why it's being used as the number one ester? And are there alternatives to testosterone cypionate that might actually be better in the TRT community? Are there are many, many different esters, and some esters will work better for one person over the other. Because why do not all esters work for each other? Because on one hand, you can say testosterone is testosterone is testosterone. And for the most part, it is. <laughs>
in particular the cypionate, has the ability to potentially crystallize if it's not stored at room temperature. So do not put your cypionate in the fridge, in the freezer, or in, in cold temperatures, because you will crystallize, you will form crystals in it, and that can cause uh, you to have to essentially remove the crystals from solution by heating up the, the cypionate. That's one of the problems with testosterone cypionate. It's a bit sensitive to temperature changes. We don't find this happens as often with the ampules because it's one ampule, one dose, uh, you use it and then you discard the rest depending on what your dose is. So there seems to be a real love affair with the multi-dose vial, especially in Europe and especially in the UK. And what we have seen is there are pros and cons to the multi-dose vial, um, especially in light of what some people are doing called microdosing, so using a small, more frequent dosing. And what I mean by that is that we've seen prescriptions anywhere from you know, 10, 15, 20, 25 milligrams a day of a testosterone ester, uh, you know, to 50 milligrams every other day, to three, you know, every three days. There are different variations for it. So if your ampule of testosterone comes in, uh, comes in 100 milligrams per two mils, then you inject two mils, okay? And these two mils uh, is the size of your injection, and you would do this every three days, every five days, every six days, depending on what you're prescribed. So where does this leave testosterone propionate. And there's this myth around testosterone propionate. I want to bring back to one other ester that's available in Europe, and that's called Sustanon, Sustanon 250. And this is one of the, 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 actually around the world, it's one of the most popular esters there are. The problem is, in the TRT community, Sustanon is not readily available. It's not licensed. It's not a, it's not a licensed product in the United States. So that means no one's gone and sought out FDA approval for Sustanon. But it is approved, equivalent to the FDA, in the UK, in most countries in Europe, in Australia, Sustanon, Sustanon is available. Sustanon's format or packaging that it's available in is 250 milligrams per one ml. And you might be interested to know that it was at one time manufactured as well as 100 milligrams in one ml. So then you had some options in dosing, but the manufacturers discontinued that uh, around 2013, uh, between 2011 and 2013, they discontinued the 100 milligrams per one ml. And so now, at least in the UK, the only licensed sustenon is 250 milligrams in one ml. And patients will use this at all various doses using what's prescribed and discarding the remaining. And why discard the remaining? Because it's not safe once an ampule is open. You're open to the air and that you risk the potential for it uh, to be contaminated. And you wouldn't want to you know, have some form of sepsis or bad infection as a result. So you have to be very careful with opening up an ampule, how you open it, and, uh, and what goes behind that. So again, that's Sustanon. Within Sustanon, and the reason why I mention it, are there are four different esters, okay? There's testosterone propionate, there's testosterone phenylpropionate, there's testosterone isocaproate, there's testosterone decanoate, are your four different esters of, and, and of various degrees. A lot of people will use a Sustanon injection and say, well, not a lot, but there are some patients who will use the testosterone called Sustanon and say or complain that it burns and stings or causes post-injection pain. And one of the reasons is not the testosterone propionate. And I think testosterone propionate has been falsely blamed as the PIP inducer, post-injection pain inducer, in Sustanon and, or at least has been uh, considered the, the, the cause of, of the post-injection pain in Sustanon. And that couldn't be, well, it could be further from the truth that testosterone propionate causes pain. Because in the right formulation, you're not going to get testosterone propionate causing pain. So getting back to Sustanon, we believe, and we've seen because we've helped thousands of patients with 
TRT and hormone replacement treatment. And one of the areas where some patients will complain of post-injection pain and others won't complain at all, or they'll, they'll, they'll notice some post-injection pain in the beginning of, treat, of the treatment. And then uh, as time goes on, they become used to it and they don't notice any more post-injection pain. But for those patients who it becomes completely intolerable and disruptive to the quality of life, then we have other options. And some of those options are testosterone sipionate, which gets imported from Europe, or testosterone sipionate in a multi-dose vial. Uh, but we also have testosterone enanthate, which is another option, but the enanthate that is available, uh, and that's another option, testosterone enanthate, and talk about that, that's also available in 100 milligrams in one ml. And that has peanut oil or arrakis oil that causes pain. And that's probably one of the reasons why sustenone causes pain. It's the formulation. So, and, and I'm not quite sold that it's just the arrakis oil because we have some patients on uh, testosterone enanthate that has arrakis oil or peanut oil in it, and they don't complain of post-injection pain. So there's something unique in either the combination of um, the arrakis oil and the various uh, preservatives like benzyl alcohol and the concentration of benzyl alcohol that may be causing some post-injection pain in some patients. Now it's ironic because benzyl alcohol should be acting as an analgesic, as a painkiller. Uh, so some of the products that use benzyl alcohol should hurt less, but in some patients they'll report some burning and stinging or, or post-injection pain, so kind of a lump or bump that occurs uh, days after they do the injection. Now, why do some people get the injection and some people don't? One of the, uh, the theories that we have of why some people may get the post-injection pain is how they've injected. So we've seen people in the past who don't do a deep intramuscular injection of sustenone. They, it tends to have the, the oil leak into the subcutaneous area and that tends to cause lumps and bumps and post-injection pain, which is why we think sustenone should never really be used for subcutaneous injections. And there's a whole other topic we can talk about. It's why subcutaneous injections may not be the best option for TRT, but we'll have that in another video. But on this video, to keep on point, sustenone's most likely causing the pain due uh, to the preservative and the amount of the preservative in it. Um, and that's potentially why some patients, not all, because many patients do really, really well on sustenone, have no problem at all. But I, the reason why I mention this is because many patients' objections to using testosterone propionate stems from misinformation about either bad formulations of propionate they've used in the past, or they try to link the sustenone and the propionate together. And I've got to say, that's not what we see at the clinic here. So, what is it about testosterone propionate for some patients could be a real wonder drug. And we've seen this in patients who've tried many other different types of esters. Why do not all esters work for each other? Because on one hand, you can say testosterone is testosterone is testosterone. And for the most part, it is. I've been able to, and my prescription switched, I've, I've used to, uh, I've, I've tried really all the esters. You know, personally, I've, I've been prescribed testosterone and nanthate. That was the first um, ester of, of testosterone that I, that I received. In fact, my first injection, the doctor had mixed in a little bit of testosterone propionate with testosterone enanthate. And I would go every two weeks for the injection. The thought was uh, a little bit of a quick uh, start of the testosterone propionate uh, would get it in my bloodstream sooner, quicker. I mean, it, there really isn't much in it. Uh, there are pharmacokinetic charts that will show that with testosterone propionate, it goes in very quickly. Um, but and so does sipionate, but then you might not get as full of an increase. Uh, but in, in reality, we can see pharmacokinetic data and they both spike very quickly. Testosterone sipionate, uh, in fact, 250 milligrams might reach as high as 80 uh, nanomolar per liter or higher in the blood. That's a measurement of testosterone uh, in the blood, which is quite high. I think that puts it well over 1500 nanograms per deciliter if you're in the United States. Where, but, but there's a lot of people that will assume that testosterone propionate is going to spike too much and then leave you short. Now, if you're injecting once a week and you do testosterone propionate once a week, that would be true. You're going to inject, you know, uh, well, if you were to inject 100 milligrams, you would get a much higher level. But in the pharmacokinetic studies that we've seen, 25 milligrams of testosterone propionate 
have give levels at least after the first injection of around 40 nanomoles per litre within the first day and then falls down to closer to 20 to 27 nanomoles per litre around by day two. So theoretically, you can inject this every other day and have really good levels. But what about stability? Everyone says, I have to have stable, stable levels. It has to be flat, stable. Well, firstly, in the body, we know that testosterone fluctuates a bit between your peak and your trough. And probably not enough for most people to notice a difference, but though some feel like there's a difference between the morning and, and, uh, and the evening. But don't forget, testosterone is three drugs in one. It's testosterone, it's estradiol, and it's dihydrotestosterone. Those are the metabolites of testosterone, whether your body makes it or you get it through an injection or cream. So there are other factors, not to mention the activation of your androgen receptor that may not notice once you reach a certain saturation point, may not notice the, the variations as much. Now, it is true that testosterone propionate is going to move up quickly and it's going to dissipate. Pharmacokinetics are different to testosterone cypionate, sustenone, testosterone and decanoate, which is also known as libido in the UK, where it's a slightly more gradual. But within the first day, and we've got some, some charts and graphs of the pharmacokinetics when they've done tests, that they, they all spike. They all spike up in the first day. So if you were to get a blood test, which you shouldn't do, you know, um, within hours or the first day after your injection, you're going to have a very high level. Um, testosterone propionate, 25 milligrams, will be somewhere around uh, 14 animals per liter. With subsequent dosing, you might get up to 45 or 50 um, within the first 24 hours, and then it should fall back down towards towards 13 animals per liter, maybe down to 27. 25 nanomoles per liter, depending as you reach a steady state. That's testosterone propionate. And that might be some of its benefit because you get this increase and then it falls back down. And reaching that trough, having that dynamic change in your testosterone levels, you might actually feel something rather than it being stable all the time. And I think what patients, when they're asking for stable levels, they're really asking that they feel stable in their mind, in their mood, in their health not necessarily their levels. Because if you're just <laughs> obsessing about your levels, then you're not really getting the full benefit of treatment if you're so worried about where your levels are. I think at the end of the day, as a patient, I'm a patient myself, I want my levels, well, I don't care about my levels, I want, I want to know that I feel good, and I want to know that I'm feeling healthy, and that, um, that when I do measure the levels, because it's important to know that I'm not going too high uh, or too low, that I, um, you know, I'm, I'm kind of, getting the, the accurate pharmacokinetics that, you know, if I'm doing my injection of testosterone, that I, I am getting enough, but not too much. Because there are particular side effects from having too much testosterone. For some patients, you can have increased uh, hematocrit and hemoglobin, or basically too many red blood cells, uh, which may thicken the blood in some cases. Um, many times the body will acclimatize to this, your body will get used to this this level uh, and, and adapt. But many times going too super physiological is not a, what TRT is about. It's, it's going too super physiological won't actually give you more benefit after a certain point. If you found this video helpful, don't forget to watch our other videos on topics around HRT and TRT. And don't forget to subscribe to the channel. And until next time, stay in good health, this is Mike from Balance My Hormones.